<laughs> Hi, everybody. About uh, 37 years ago, as Amy mentioned, my colleagues and I at Motorola uh, started a revolution, a revolution that was based upon one very simple fact. The people are fundamentally, naturally, inherently mobile. You can see that every day when you go down on the freeway. Everybody's going somewhere. Nobody is where they want to be. <laughs> and yet, for over 100 years, the phone company told us that if we wanted to communicate, we wanted to talk to somebody, that we had to be tied to our desk with a copper wire, trapped in our homes, again, with that same copper wire. Uh, and so the revolution that we started was, as Amy's already told you, what we finally call the brick. <laughs> it does weigh two and a half pounds. It's, uh, the battery life is 20 minutes, but that's not a problem because you can't hold it up for more than 20 minutes. <laughs> and what made it a revolution? Well, there are some almost 5 billion people. Most of the people on Earth today use cell phones and all of their lives have been changed, even those that don't use f phones. Very simply put, it used to be that when you made a phone call, you called a place. Today, when you make a phone call, you're calling a person. So that revolution started. Uh, we created this phone in 1973. The service started in 83. By 1990, things are really serious, and the phone company announced that we're going to have a new revolution. We're going to call that the digital revolution. And here it is now 2010, and we're still waiting. I mean, I'd hardly call texting uh, a revolution. We had texting uh, 40 years ago. We used to call it uh, two-way paging, but same thing. Uh, email, I, I hardly would call getting your email a half hour earlier while on your phone uh, revolutionary. But there are some revolutions that wireless is engendering that are starting now. And I'm just going to spend the next six minutes and 30 seconds <laughs> to tell you about two of them. It gives me three minutes of revolution. What a, what, a, what a challenge. One of the biggest problems in our society is uh, health care. We spend 20% of our national gross product on health care today. Uh, that's going up very rapidly. The system is broken. The system is basically intended to cure disease. There is an opportunity with wireless to do something really wonderful. You're all familiar with the concept of the uh, uh, annual physical examination, which I do every five years. <laughs> there, uh, the physicals are virtually worthless because they take a snapshot of somebody at a point in time and uh, people are different. You can't tell anything with a measurement at an individual point in time. I'm not suggesting that the uh, physical exams are totally worthless because going to your doctor does have some value, and that may be the only value. But suppose that we could have a constant, a continuous physical examination, that we could measure every element of your body on a continuing basis. We could look at characteristics that we've determined from your genome where you're susceptible for, for, to particular diseases, and we can look out for those things. The revolution that we could engender is one of anticipating disease and preventing it rather than curing it. Huge, huge difference. If we can really accomplish that, we will take a broken healthcare system and repair it. And can we do it? The technology all exists. The ability to sense Virtually everything on the human body exists today. The wireless systems exist. We've got some really difficult legal problems, uh, some computer problems, but all of these are solvable. And I just want to show you uh, one example, if I can find it in my pocket. Now, this is a patch. This exists today. You can put on your body, and it counts the number of calories you consume and the number of calories that you uh, use up uh, by working. 
And so you could imagine this particular device telling you, ah, ah, ah don't touch that dessert because you're going to exceed your, your, uh, uh, your intake is going to exceed your output. And uh, let me tell you, obesity is a really serious problem. So uh, huge, huge opportunity. But what is the biggest problem that society faces today? Anybody like to take a guess? I can't hear you. It is poverty. That really is the biggest worldwide problem. And the only solution to the problem of, of uh, poverty is productivity. If we can raise the productivity of human beings so that there are more things, more food, uh, more of everything uh, that we can spread around all the population of the world, it will solve many, many problems, much more than just the want of people but perhaps even uh, eliminate wars. How do you uh, increase productivity? Well, the historical way to do that is to make capital investment. Uh, one of those capital investments, by the way, is a cell phone. And one of the big advantages of cell phones uh, uh, is, in fact, the improvement of productivity. And the uh, gains that we'll get out of that kind of investment are going to continue for many years, but they move at a relatively slow rate because you can only accumulate capital at a slow rate. <clears throat> well, we have another form of capital that we are starting to learn about, uh, and that is human capital. We're starting to learn about systems that let us collaborate better, more efficiently, and that is going to generate not just increases of 30% in gross national products, but multiples. Now, how did I learn about that? Well. About a year ago, I got onto uh, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, not because I understood any of these things, but I really wanted to know what was going on. Uh, and it took me a long time, and it finally dawned upon me. Everybody here old enough to remember Pong, the computer game? It was totally mindless, but it trapped us. It got us understanding that the machines were, could be fun. That's exactly what Twitter and Facebook and all these things are. And those elements, Twitter, Facebook, are moving into the enterprise. And I'm just going to give you a very quick example uh, of how that's going to revolutionize how we do things. And my example is going to be relevant to those of you that work for corporations. It's called the corporate meeting. The corporate meeting uh, is intended to solve problems, uh, to make decisions, you know, get people to think out of the box. And the first thing they do is start creating boxes. We've got the box of the organization chart. That's where we pick the people from. And we've got the box of the schedule. We can only do it at a certain time. We have the box of the meeting room. And you can only get so many people in the meeting room. And on and on. And by the time you get done, you get a bunch of people stuck in a room for a short period of time. And they're told, be creative. <laughs> What's the way of the future? Let's create our own group whose function is solve a problem. Let's do some research. I think we call that Google. Let's get this group communicating with each other uh, and in very short messages. We call that Twitter. And let's have a wall that we can put information on and maybe several for each aspect of the problem. Uh, we call that Facebook. It turns out you put all of these elements together and what happens? The good ideas blossom and grow. The bad ideas disappear we end up with what I call a self-organizing system for creativity. That is the kind of thing that is going to give us multiples of productivity. I know you're a little skeptical, but believe it or not, they were skeptical about the cell phone too. So 20 years from now, come back and talk to me, and remember that Marty told you this was going to happen. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>